Russ. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. And as we begin, as we begin to look at the words that our Heavenly Father have given through Mrs. White, let's ask for his guidance so that we may more carefully consider the elements and the examples that are being presented before us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of Sabbath rest. We thank you for the blessings that you are providing, for your guidance, for your watch care, and for the opportunity that we have at this time in this earth's history. Direct us now. Help us as we open your word. that your spirit may be with us, that your angels may attend us, that we may carefully consider all that is written so that we may more fully understand the message that we are to give. We are coming to understand, Father, that we cannot give a message that we don't understand. Direct us now. Be with us, we pray. Help us to understand so that this message of warning may be clearly given to a world that is in apostasy. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. Now, there's a question that I have to ask each of you. What is the purpose of these studies that we have been doing these last many Sabbath mornings? Uncover light. Okay. But the, the ultimate premise of the study has been what? Well, it's a rebuke. The ultimate premise has been so that we can be prepared to take minor prophets and compare them more carefully with the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's that's where you start, started with. Now, there has been one element over these last several Sabbaths that has been in each study. What element has that was what element has that been? Over the last several Sabbaths, we have been looking into the book of Zephaniah. Mm -hmm. That is the one element each Sabbath that has been a common thread in each study. Now, today is no different. We're going to be looking at one and possibly two letters that Mrs. White had written that are very specific, that are very direct. This one is a message to our leading physicians. This is a non-published letter, a non-published manuscript. It's actually published twice because she had a couple of different versions of this that she sent out or that she had written, I'm sorry. Now, why is it important that we should look at a message to our leading physicians? Well, um, the medical aspects, I'm sorry, the health aspects, that's the wedge, the golden wedge, isn't it? Right. Um, so it makes sense that, um, for me anyway, it makes sense that uh, to study what she said to the physicians 
because these are supposedly um, the higher learning people. Um, so it would make sense to whatever encouragement or rebukes that she would give them that it would be important to us. Okay. Especially if there's some sort of parallels going on. Now, I agree with, with everything you just said, brother. Here's our, here's the other part of the issue. The health message is the what of the gospel beyond the, the golden wedge. The right arm. It, it is indeed the right arm of the gospel. Yeah, and the idea there is that it, it opens the door, she says. So right. it's, it's um, the purpose is that we can, it's like an entering wedge, I guess, too. But the idea is that we can, um, through taking care of people's physical needs who are seeking God and who want to be healed, we can reach them uh, with the gospel. I had uh, used the gold, the al I mean, I'm sorry, the analogy of uh, that golden wedge is what holds the door open for us to communicate. Okay. Now, there are seven of us that are here for the morning study. As we go through this, I'm going to have some time, so I'm going to ask others to read and just ask for volunteers. But we're going to go through this kind of step by step, paragraph by paragraph, to see what we're able to glean from this message for our time. Please note, this is one of those documents that one or more typed copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which can be viewed at the main office of the Ellen White estate. These additional typed copies have yet to be published. I have a message for our physicians. My brethren, the Lord has committed to each of you a work which is plainly outlined in his word. You are in great need of clear discernment in order that you may, may, may not betray the sacred trust that is committed to you. From this I take that we are in need of great discernment, that we are in need of clear discernment. Those who are connected with the Battle Creek Sanitarium have evidence that the testimony borne by me during the General Conference of 1901 was of God. At this meeting, the Lord encouraged Dr. Kellogg, but Dr. Kellogg has used this encouragement to exalt and glorify himself. He has lent himself to the service of the arch deceiver, who is playing the game of life for his soul. Where, said the angel of God, has been your discernment? Could you not discern that in following him, you will soon be adrift in faith and in doctrine? Dr. Kellogg does not know that by his course, he is ruining himself. He may think to build up the reputation of a great man, but the greatness he would gain is worthless in the estimation of heaven. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.19 Men may call him great, but by the heavenly host, he is called the least. We cannot afford to follow any man because we cannot afford to place ourselves so that we would soon be adrift in faith and doctrine. 
to do so imperils our souls. It imperils our lives. It imperils us for eternity. How many great men are being so lauded within the church and the movement at this time? How many are placing their very souls in following these supposed great men? My brethren, in the name of the Lord, I say unto you, be careful how you voice the words and practice the methods of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. Be careful how you accept his version of the testimonies that God has given me for his people. If you sustain his propositions, as you are in danger of doing, you will displease the Lord God of heaven. There are many testimonies that are given that specific light had been given to Dr. Kellogg. But by the time that this letter is written, Dr. Kellogg was very much in apostasy. The Lord does not acknowledge Dr. Kellogg's course as pleasing to him. God condemns the course that he has followed. His boasting is abhorrent to him. He may think that he has clothed himself in the garments of righteousness, but should he come thus clothed to the marriage supper of the Lamb, it would be seen that he has on the dress of a civilian. How can we interrelate this with what we saw in the message last Sabbath? Right now, Dr. Kellogg's course is being called out as a specific warning. We are to be clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. We are to be so clothed with what he provides, not the cloak of our own making. What happened to the man that came to the feast and did not accept? the robe of Christ's righteousness. What did the king say to him? Cast him out. That's what he did. What did the king say to him? Friend, how okay, Miss Stout. Sorry, theater, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? Is that wedding garment freely offered to you? Is that free is that wedding garment freely offered to me? Mm -hmm. What is the cost of that wedding garment? Christ's life. What does it cost us? Free. It costs us pain and suffering and trials, and they're all worth it. I would I would have to, I, I would have to say that it costs us faith. Well, that's all involved because without that faith, we wouldn't be willing to go through all that suffering. It is freely offered. 
our faith is required. The Lord Jesus was displeased with Dr. Kellogg's course of action at the Oakland Conference. At one time, it was presented to me that angels clothed with beautiful garments were escorting Dr. Kellogg from place to place and inspiring him to speak words of boasting, which were offensive to God. Heavenly messengers were viewing all that took place. They heard the words and witnessed the acts that were of a nature to bring glory to man rather than to God. At this time, our brother was not led by the Spirit of God. His threats that he would bring the law to bear upon those who crossed his track showed that he was in the same condition as those to whom the Laodicean message is addressed. My experience during the Oakland Conference was a very painful one. The Lord instructed me that I was to have no conversation with Dr. Kellogg, lest I give him occasion to misinterpret me and to present my words in a false light to his fellow physicians. I have repeatedly been instructed to have no controversy with the doctor because the enemy works upon his imagination leading him to make statements that are not true. Those who accept these statements and carry them out in practice will separate themselves from the great medical director. Are we to have controversy with other brothers and sisters in this movement? No, we're not. Are we to have controversy with others that have remained within the corporate church? No. Nope. When controversy arises, where is this controversy coming from? Well, it comes from Satan. All right. The accuser of the brethren. Exactly. My heart is heavy with these situations. When we have others that are choosing to accuse, when there are others that are choosing to enter into controversy, we have situations that we need to step back away from because we are not to have controversy we are not to allow the adversary to work upon our imaginations mm -hmm. this is a time when satan's deceptive power is exercised not only upon the minds of inexperienced youth but upon the minds of men and women of mature years Men in positions of responsibility are in danger of changing leaders. This I know because it has been plainly revealed to me. Three years ago, back more than three years ago, I received a telephone call. It was from a brother that I have trusted. The brother was very excited. The brother said to me, we have a new leader. Because of admonitions like this from the spirit of prophecy, when someone says to me, we have a new leader, it creates a problem for me. I listened quietly. I said nothing. For this movement has no leader, save Christ. 
but when this new leader was being fully introduced, there were many aspects with Parminder, with Tess, with Tamina, with others that greatly concerned me. And when this was finally fully revealed, it came as a shock to some, but it came as a relief to me. Christ never compels men to accept him or believe his words. Were he in Battle Creek Sanitarium in person, he might not be able to lead all to stand on his side, where they could see the terrible deceptive working of satanic influences. If Christ could not lead them, that to me is a scary thought. It's almost on a par with the thought that if Christ himself had appeared at the 1888 General Conference session, that the delegates there would have crucified him anew. When Christ was on this earth in person, he said of the cities which had been so many of his, that had seen so many of his mighty works, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Luke 10, 13 and 14. From this scripture, we learn that those who place themselves in a position of resistance against the holy influences are not affected even by the pleadings of Jesus Christ. What does that say to each of us today? What impact does that have upon our hearts? The first three messages that I bore during the conference of 1901, messages that bore unmistakable evidence of being given under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, made a deep impression on Dr. Kellogg's mind. At one time during the conference, the doctor came into my room and told me, that during one of my talks, his brother, who was sitting beside him, was deeply touched by what I had said. His tears flowed freely, and he said, John, she speaks by the inspiration of the Spirit of God as one having authority from God. And as the doctor told me this, he said, my own heart was thrilled by the power of God. His Spirit sustained you in speaking. But the enemy, he just a little bit of background on that general conference. Sure. I mean, sorry to interrupt. Please. please. Um, but this is the general conference session where uh, it begins with basically um, the leadership pat patting themselves on the back for all of the progress that they have had. Right. And then Ellen White gets up and says that we. Um, have not done the work that God asked us to do and that there needs to be a work of reorganization. So, so that's the context in which this is, this is occurring. And it was a very powerful uh, presentation she did on what needed to be accomplished. That uh, there was too much control from Battle Creek. When I was reading through this, I considered looking into those first three messages. Mm -hmm. And it may be something to, for me to look at here this next week. 
Yeah. Well, well, I have read them. Okay. It was uh, back in the 1980s, so it's been a while. Okay. As much as he was being led by the adversary, Kellogg could still recognize that the Spirit of God was sustaining Mrs. White because she was having to stand up against the leadership of the church. But the enemy, he who worked on the minds of angels in heaven to lead them to disloyalty, has been working on human minds. I have been instructed that Satan seeks to link up with men bearing large responsibilities in the Lord's work in order that he may fill their minds with evil devisings. Under his influence, men will suggest many things that are contrary to the mind of God. Can we not take this as a specific warning? Our physicians, upon whom important responsibilities rest, should have clear spiritual discernment so that they shall not act like blind men. They are to stand constantly on guard Dangers that we do not now discern will soon break upon us, and I greatly desire that our physicians shall not be deceived. Who's she speaking to here? Is she not speaking to us that stand in the last day preparing to give this final message of warning? The showing at the Battle Creek Sanitarium is not in harmony with the Lord's design for that institution. I have been instructed that in building so large a sanitarium in Battle Creek, men have followed their own devising. They have not been led by the Lord, but have gone decidedly contrary to the light that he has given. I write these words in order that the example that has been set in Battle Creek shall not be followed in other places. For it is not in accordance with God's plan. Instead of so large an institution being built in one place, plants should have been made in cities in which there is nothing to represent the truth. The sanitarium at Battle Creek will place in close association a large number of believers and unbelievers. The Lord is calling for separation from the world, but this institution will call for the mingling of our youth with worldlings. This association will bring great temptation to the youth. The genuine work of soul saving that could have been done, that could be done, where fewer unbelievers gathered together in one place shall be greatly retarded. Every believer who constantly realizes his dependence on God has his appointed angel sent from heaven to minister to him. What a promise is this? How much do we praise God for the fact that there is an appointed angel sent from heaven to minister to us? The ministry of these angels is especially essential now, for Satan is making his last desperate effort to secure the world. The movement at Battle Creek is one that will help the enemy to spoil the faith of many. It will tend to destroy the identity of Seventh-day Adventists as the Lord's peculiar people. 
every satanic agency is now at work with power from beneath. The day of death is not set before us in the word as the great constraining motive that is to impel us to be zealous and earnest in our service for God. What motive does God present in his word to his workers, ministers, and gospel medical missionaries? The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly. Zephaniah 1.14. And before the coming of this great day, we are to proclaim to the world the last message of mercy, that men and women may be prepared for Christ's coming. The enemy will devise many plans to occupy minds and to divert attention from this message. But we are to go forward with our work. The end of all things is at hand. The coming of the Lord in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory is very near. At this time, when wickedness is at its height, ministers of the gospel are crying peace and safety. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 Upon those minds are thus set at rest, sudden destruction cometh, unprepared, they shall not escape. Whose minds, bro? Upon those whose minds are thus set at okay. rest. Upon those whose minds are thus set at rest. In other words, those that accept the message of peace and safety, right? Correct. So my question is this. When we have those that are decrying the publishing of the warning to Nashville, that are attempting to make it of none effect. Agree. Then are they not giving such a peace and safety message? Yes. Are those ministers then under the influence of Christ or under the influence of Satan? Seem like that other guy. Okay. What happens to the people? that are accepting the message that they should not accept this word of warning? Well, um, a few paragraphs up, it said that, uh, or comparatively, um, they're heading for destruction. But we have five words in front of us. Unprepared, they shall not escape. And there you have it. When Christ comes together to himself, those who have been faithful, the last trump will sound, and the whole earth, from the summits of the loftiest mountains to the lowest recesses of the deepest mines, will hear. The righteous dead will hear the sound of the trump and will come forth from their graves to be clothed with immortality and to meet their Lord. And those who pierced the Savior, who scourged and crucified him, will also be raised to behold him whom they mocked and despised coming in the clouds of heaven, attended by the heavenly host. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The day so of whenever the Lord, I looked at, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Whenever I looked at that uh, idea of those that scourged him will come up, I, I always just seen these two Roman soldiers, but now I see a whole host of people 
uh, the Jews that allowed it to happen, that type of thing. Um, before, I never seen that. I mean, it's just something that these statements bring out. Who was the one that caused Christ to be scourged? Uh, the individual, the sole individual was Pilate, wasn't it? But the, the people that were uh, the leaders of the Jews were asking for this. I'm, I'm referring more to this with Caiaphas. The high priest. The high priest. Here's Caiaphas. He was a member of, of what sect? The Pharisees. I believe he was a member of the Sadducees. No argument. Okay. Um, what was what, what was one of the points that the Sadducees and the Pharisees disagreed upon? The resurrection. Can you imagine the horror of a man like Caiaphas who set aside the understanding of the resurrection to all of a sudden be fully resurrected, return to his body, to be standing watching the one that he believed should be destroyed for the good of the Jews coming as the king of glory. There's a lot in that. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot in that. There is. I mean, the, uh, the guy's going to come up without a new body. It's going to be in his old body, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, so he's going to have a, a visual reference because the people that may or may not have been associated with him at that point, looking around going, ooh, and then looking at all the other guys going, oh, my God, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> all that stuff flooding in all at that moment, that's going to be really bad. I mean, I, I look at this because Caiaphas will be raised up. There will be some, some of the people of his generation that will be there with him. There will be Romans. All of a sudden, all of these people, and there's going to be those that are there to welcome Christ. But Caiaphas is going to be one that he wanted nothing to do with Christ. And all of a sudden, he's going to be raised up, which he didn't believe in. So his the tenets of his faith are largely going to be denied at that point. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. This scene has been presented before me as fully as I could bear to behold it. Then the scene has changed and representations of things existing at the present time have passed before me. I have seen men who have been placed in positions of trust as watchmen, molding and fashioning the work in accordance with worldly policy, which God condemns. The medical missionary work is sick and needs the restoring power of the great healer before it can accomplish a work in harmony with its name. If the medical missionary work is the opening wedge, if it is the right arm of the gospel, is she not seeing here that the gospel is sick and is not being properly presented? 
Again, she repeats, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Why would she choose to repeat this? What is she saying to us by its repetition? I'm looking at this as an admonition and warning. Pay attention. If we are not willing to pay attention to the words that she is presenting, to the examples that she is giving, then what are we doing? Christ gave his life for the salvation of the world. One place is not to be worked over and over again, while other parts of God's world are left barren and unworked. God's only begotten son gave his life as a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Christ also hath loved us, Paul writes, and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet swelling savor, Ephesians 5.2. This he did that we may be all that he desires us to be, representatives of him, living lives that reveal his fragrance of character, his purity of thought. He died that others, beholding him, might be led to desire to be like him, pure and undefiled, wholly acceptable to God, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Well, in that, I see an admonition for um, the study of God's character. Because she's telling us... Uh, that what did he say? Christ also left his. And he that this is this he did that we may be all that he desires us to be, representatives of him, living lives that reveal his fragrance of, and that key word is character. Right. His purity of thought. Bang. That's the thought. That's. That's how we're to be. We're try to be like-minded. And the only way we can do that is to have a complete understanding without defect. So we're admonished to be very, very careful in our studies. Right. Not to get self-absorbed. You know, well, this is the way I think it is. That's, that's just the way I think it is. That's, I've got a feeling. These are the, the repetitive things that I keep hearing instead of, well, this is why, and then showing me the verses. Okay. Good points. Any other comment at this point? One of the things that I have been learning as I have prepared for these studies, Mrs. White has had quite a bit to say regarding the book of Zephaniah. So far in assembling in context, the items that she's had to say about Zephaniah, 60 pages of different warnings, different examples are being put together regarding Zephaniah chapter one alone. When these are complete, I will see to it that this, along with the book of Zephaniah, chapter one with specific comments from the spirit of prophecy are then presented for your reading 
and for your admonition. So uh, you'll be providing those notes, is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. Manuscript 41, 1906. Universal guilt during the time of the end. What should we notice about something written in 1906? Nashville Vision. Nashville Vision had occurred in 1905, yes. What happened in 1906? Well, this was the time of, of the earthquake in San Francisco. I think it was April 18th, 1906. Okay. Right. So let's see what we can do to get through this manuscript today as well. I'm going to read the first paragraph. I will ask someone else to volunteer to read the following two. There is coming very soon an almost universal guilt upon the cities that are increasing in determined wickedness. God has given life to the creature man in order that through a knowledge of the word and by practicing its principles, the human agent may become one with God, obedient to the divine will. But Satan has been working constantly by many devisings to bring man into disfavor with God. Can someone else read the next two paragraphs? In the, in the antediluvian world, human agencies brought in all manner of devisings and ingenious practices to make of none effect the law of Jehovah. They cast aside his authority because it interfered with their schemes. As in the days before the flood, so now the time is right upon us when the Lord God must reveal his omnipotent power. Even many of those who claim to believe the truth do not practice the truth. They have the word, but they do not live in accordance with its precepts. Their business affairs are not conducted in harmony with its teachings. The devising of men and executing their own purposes reveals the masterly hand of the enemy. Satan is working with skill and with deceptive power to counterwork the express will of God made plain in his word. For years, Satan has been taking control of many human minds. The right doers who would fear and glorify God will use the words of David. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Psalm 119, 126. And it is only when men reach this point in towns and in cities that the universal perversion of the law of Jehovah becomes a destructive determined evil. Through his prophet Zephaniah, the Lord specifies the things that he will bring upon evildoers. Okay, now we're going to stop there. This passage that is quoted as written by David. Psalm 119, 126. I find it interesting because as we look at this, we have 9-11. And 126 of both the 1260 and the 2520. Interesting uh -huh. symbols for our consideration. Yep, 911, 119, and 126. So, where we have 911 and we have 119, or, or as we would say, November 9th. In either way we look at this, we are being presented with symbols that we have been studying and observing in many different ways within this movement. Now, 
I would like to ask someone else to read these next two paragraphs. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the bowels of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm and them that are turned back from the Lord and those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for him. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guest. Next one. Yes, please. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. Zephaniah 1, 2 through 9. What symbols are we able to glean where we are looking at these that are them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and that swear by the Lord? and that swear by Malcolm. That's Molech. Okay, and what, what was Molech? Um, he was that God that they sacrificed their children to. The modern Molech is abortion. I would say so. Let us consider that for a moment. Well, now they've added injections for babies and on up. So I would include that in worship of Moloch. I've posted it on Facebook and they probably kicked me off. But I copied, hand copied what I'd written. And it's going to go to politicians, etc. They've also taken over, they being whoever, my other laptop i can't do anything with it right now except look in my files so i keep bringing it in to be repaired and they keep doing things with it and i'm just going to say look i copied this page if i now have a restricted computer on the other one this one is still working fine because nothing has been on, installed on it to prevent me from going on on the web thank god so please pray that this one stays un on uh, whatever you unspoiled, because if you don't think that censorship exists and you're not being spied on, you better wake up. We are. In these situations, there are those that will not like many of these things that are being said. We are living in a world that is wanting to turn its back upon God. We are living in a world that believes that they are worshiping God when they are worshiping man. We are living in a world that does not wish to inquire of God, that does not ask for his leadership, that does not ask for him to have control of their lives. Here we are told, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests.
on that day, he will punish the princes and the king's children and all such that are clothed with strange apparel. What strange apparel is being referenced here? Strange doctrine. Okay. If we go back to our study on Achan, what did Babylonian, he, Babylonian yeah. garments. Exactly. So if we equate strange doctrine with the Babylonian garments, are we not seeing that this is the character of Rome? The character of characters as you as you said is that correct well we recall that mrs white said that that the romish church is satan's masterpiece and i'm personally seeing that more and more he's got agents everywhere and a lot of them are not aware of what they're doing And yeah, they think they're doing what God wants them to do. Instead of studying the word, they go off by impressions. Well, when they study the word, how are they studying it? Well, that's the question. <laughs> are, they, are, are they using Miller's rules? Evidently not. Okay. Well, I mean, so I wasn't, I haven't grown up as an Adventist. I came into the movement a while back, but not the movement, but the Advent movement. And um, while I was in church on a regular basis, I never even heard Miller's Rules mentioned uh, by anybody in the church per se. It was only by people that were not really connected to the church other than that they were Seventh-day Adventist, but they weren't really in the church anymore it was those people that i got that uh, what, information from what year did you come in ron uh, 2001 was the no, uh, i came in yeah, 10 years before and, you and fortunately there were a handful of people that that were true sdas and yet since then they've decided that they should stay with the mainstream. Like maybe within the last few years, they've come out because it's been a while since I've spoken with them. But it was all pressed together, brethren. You know, you should still tie it. Pressed together, pressed conflict. together. It's always what I always exactly. heard. Exactly. Well. And I was saying, saying, well, why does Alan White say this? Why do your own writing say this? And, you know, there's so many things going wrong with the church. Oh, don't look at the church. Half this congregation isn't co converted. Just look to Jesus. And it's true, we should be looking to Jesus, but I couldn't stand what I saw around me. And after I decided I'm going to draw away from this, what is the alternative? I went through again. What is the alternative? And finally, God showed me this movement. And then he's directing me the last while to really work on the problems in my own self, in my own life. As this warning has continued, in the same day, so this is the day that he will punish the princes and the king's children and those that are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day, also, I will punish all those that leap in the, on the threshold and which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. We are to be prepared because this day is soon to come. As she continues here, this is being literally fulfilled and has been fulfilled for years in the course of some who have had great light and many opportunities to know and understand the ways and the works of God. 
And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and a howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Moktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down. All they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled upon their leaves, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and of desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that ye shall be hid in the days of the Lord's anger. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. Zephaniah 1, 10 to 18, 2, 1 to 3, and verse 5. The passage that strikes me hardest here, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Is she presenting two doublings? And to whom is she presenting this? So my question is, who is the nation not desired? Symbolically, who can we apply this to? To ourselves. Could we apply this to the movement itself? Yes. Yes. Are we not being given the admonition to gather together within the movement? Amen. How can one gather together if they are not in unity? Impossible. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together. Is this not a repeat 
a doubling. Yes. Are we not told to gather together before the Lord's anger should come upon us, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you? Yeah. That's why I believe that persecution is going to have to come upon us before this happens, because it seems that ad admonition isn't working. Trying to reason with people hasn't worked. So, I mean, I, I just need to, we all need to really get down in prayer and say, please, Lord, work in us, work in the others, help us to come into unity. Otherwise, the only way the Lord is going to purge us is through persecution. I can't see any other way. Uh, the word cherithite, cherithites means who cut or tear away. So in other words, the nation of those that cut and tear away. Would that be right? Yeah, sounds, seems to be, yeah. Uh... Those that are seeking disunity, that are seeking to tear away, that are seeking to separate. Would that be a fair description then of the nation of the Karathites? Yes. So this is a warning for this that is ongoing within the movement today. These conditions are to exist. And as a messenger whom God has sent, I write these words of warning. If you would, please, if someone would, please read the next two paragraphs. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Zephaniah 3, 8-13. Please note that Mrs. White stated that these conditions are to exist, and as a messenger whom God has sent, I write these words of warning. She is combining her word of warning with that of Zephaniah. Here we have a prophet of the Old Testament with a prophet of the movement. She is placing herself with Zephaniah. Therefore, she is placing Zephaniah today. For me, it makes Zephaniah's warnings not just that of a bygone time, but of the movement and the time today.
In this our time, some whose tongues are deceitful have been representing many things that they themselves have formed and testified to, as if the law of truth were in their heart and coming from their lips. But the Lord will surely punish every deceitful lying tongue that has caused his people to err and to turn from the righteousness of Christ. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord God is in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over them with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee. I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 20. Is this not a great promise? Is this not a promise that we can hold on to at this time? Amen. Yes, yes. With the warning, God always has promises too. Exactly. Now, I need to ask that someone else Read the next two chapters, please. I'll read this, um, this one quote right here. That's all right. Okay. I have instructed to give, give from the Lord, given from the Lord, the conditions of, of things in Battle Creek is to be carefully marked out and understood those who have brought about this condition are sadly deceived but the lord will be glorified all the those who have taken counsel of god will walk very humbly before him in no case are there in no case in no case are they to be de, diverted. De, de, diverted from the light that God has given to his people. They are not to believe falsehood, published lies, spiritual transformations are to be taken place. In this situation, thank you, brother. Those who have brought about this condition are sadly deceived. Now, when we're looking at this, of the condition of things in Battle Creek, what was she saying? The condition of things in Battle Creek at that time were at the head of the movement. When she says that she had 
instruction to give from the Lord. That the condition of things in Battle Creek is to be clearly marked out and understood. Those who have brought about this condition are sadly deceived. Who was it that was sadly deceived? Leadership in Battle Creek. Do we apply this today? Not only to the leadership of the church, but, but also to the movement? To ourselves. Yeah, we well, have to. Me too. Yes, we do. But the Lord will be glorified. Amen. All of those who have taken the counsel of God will walk very humbly before him. In no case are they to be diverted from the light that God has given his people. They, we, are not to believe falsehoods, which are published lies. We are not to believe these published lies if they come from the church. Over the years that I have, I have worked as an adult, I have been very saddened by the fact that the Adventist Health Network has been very clear in the fact that they are instructed by the government of their need to perform abortions. There are many that are within the church today that believe everything that they are being told not only about the fact that abortions are a good thing, but that the government has our best interest at heart. We are not to believe the falsehoods, the published lies. Spiritual transformations are to take place. A voice is to be heard in the tabernacle, giving the word of God in clear notes of warning for this time. God has his human instrumentalities that shall not hold their peace. They are to advocate the word of God and work and the word and the way of the Lord to be accomplished through his human instrumentalities. In a clear, decided manner, they are to proclaim the truth in distinct lines. None of the dangerous sophistries devised by Satan are to be introduced. For these lead to skepticism of the fundamental truths that the Lord has substantiated by many miraculous miraculous evidences during the past half century. A voice is to be heard in clear affirmation of the truth, in contradistinction to the skepticism and the fallacies that have been coming in from the enemy of truth. Spiritual transformations will take place, and the working out of the principles of divine truth will reveal the change of character, for the divine agencies are efficient to address the human understandings, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Oh, let us win souls to Christ. Let us labor as those who have experienced the virtue of truth as it is in Jesus. So did we just hear our mission? Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that this is, this is 
this is answering our question. We say we don't know what the message is, but there it is. It's very direct, isn't it? Is it not laid out in very clear lines? I would say absolutely clear and to the point and exactly what it's about. Hmm. There is to be at this period. What does that say to you? There is to be at the current time. Yeah, right now. A series of events which will reveal that God is the master of the situation. The truth will be proclaimed in clear, unmistakable language. Those who preach the truth will strive to demonstrate the truth by a well-ordered life and godly conversation. And as they do this, they will become powerful in advocating the truth and in giving it the sure application that God has given it. That sounds like a promise to me. How can we see it as anything less? You need to look at those who preach the truth will strive to demonstrate the truth by a well-ordered life and godly conversation. It's one thing to be able to speak the word. It's quite another thing to be able to live it. And we can't live it without his power. We need to realize our de total dependence on him moment by moment. Agreed. Agreed. The truth as it is in Jesus, as it was proclaimed by him when he was enshrouded in the pillar cloud, is verity and truth in this our day, and will just as surely renovate the mind of the receiver as it has renovated minds in the past. Christ has declared, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke 16, 31. <clears throat> As a people, we must prepare the way of the Lord under the overruling guidance of the Holy Spirit. For the spread of the gospel in its purity, the stream of living water is to deepen and widen on its course. In all fields, nigh and far off, men will be called from the plow and from the more common commercial business vocations that largely occupy the mind and will become educated in connection with men who have had experience, men who understand the truth. Through most wonderful workings of God, mountains of difficulties will be removed and cast into the sea. She seems to be uh, um, saying that that's the repeat in history. Yes. Because she's already gone through it herself. And she's, she's asked, presenting this is for us. This yeah, is for she's, our understanding. She's presenting this for us for today. Right. Yeah, this is definitely present truth. When the men who have known and taught the truth turn aside unto their own human understanding and meet out to deceived minds their own dish of fables. It is high time for those who have been drawn away from the management of restaurants to come into line, study their Bibles diligently, and with the word of God in their hand, let there be created a restaurant from whence may be served Bible food, rich and immortalized, immortalized by the cooperation of heavenly angels 
with human agencies. This kind of work now calls for the workmen of divine appointment. Omnipotence will then say to the mountains of difficulty, be thou removed and cast into the sea. The message that means so much to the dwellers upon the earth will be seen and understood. Men will know what is truth. Onward and still onward is the work to advance. The most marked events of providence will be seen and recognized, and it will be seen that the truth bears away the victory. That's a great quote. <clears throat> yep. I agree. To all students, we would say, in the name of the Lord, do not permit yourselves to be held where the spiritual atmosphere is poisoned with skepticism and falsehood, as it is today in some places. Those who have had the evidence of truth, but who for days, for weeks, for months, and years have had about them a subtle influence that gives a false representation to the truth of God, are not fit teachers for our youth. Where falsehoods are reported as truth is no place for students who are preparing for the future immortal life. We are seeking heaven, wherein can enter none who have changed the truth of God into a lie. There's much, much more that is going to be said within this document, but we are coming to the close of our time together today. This document is showing us, it is giving us our marching orders. It is showing what needs to be done at this time. Where are those that will stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel? Where are those that will speak according to his word, to the revelation of his character? Consider this carefully. There is much yet to be addressed. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are giving. We thank you for these words of warning for these admonitions, for these timely admonitions that you are leaving for us. May we have the strength and the wisdom to accept these warnings, to take them to heart so that we may truly eat of your flesh and drink of your blood, to be led by you. We thank you for the influence of your spirit. We thank you for the ministrations of your angels. We thank you for each one that has come and participated today. Help us each one now. As we separate, that we may come again together that we may come again to learn for all that you would have us to do. Be with us now. For this we ask, for this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.